In the last year, I've covered some amazing hardware here on the channel. Brand new AMD Genoa and Intel Granite Rapids servers, RTX A5000 GPUs. They're all great fun, but that doesn't mean I've forgotten about home lab or SMB spaces. Today, we're gonna go back to my roots, building a budget home lab server and NAS combo using parts that just about anyone can afford. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. So I was browsing AliExpress last month, as I often do, and I came across a rather interesting looking motherboard. It was a micro ATX size board with a 2011-3 socket and a C612 chipset. Nothing too unusual there. But rather than being advertised as an X99 workstation or gaming board like so many other Chinese market systems, the Cloudstar CS612 is aimed at a NAS and server board, and the feature set seems to fit that bill. There's an LGA 2011-3 socket, which will support both Intel Xeon V3 and V4 CPUs up to 22 cores. The board itself supports quad-channel DDR4 up to 2400 MTS, and it does have a pretty odd layout of six DIMM slots. The two channels on the left of the CPU support just a single DIMM each, while the two channels to the right are dual rank, allowing two DIMMs per channel. The reason for this odd layout is actually to allow space for a feature I've not seen in any other Chinese market X99 motherboard, a dedicated A-speed AS2 2400 with onboard VGA for video out. Typically, these unofficial X99 boards don't have onboard video and require an add-in video card if you want to connect a monitor. That's a pretty common thing to install if you're building a gaming PC or a workstation, but it's a pretty critical feature to have if you're setting up a server. With this board, you get onboard video, freeing up a PCI Express slot for just about any other purpose that you can think of. Now, the AST2400 chip that's used is typically used as an IPMI controller, but unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case here. The chip is only providing onboard video, not complete lights out management. But the onboard video isn't the only thing that caught my eye. The real reason I wanted this board was for the 10 onboard SATA ports. Most budget server motherboards tend to skimp on storage options, which means if you want more than, say, four SATA ports, you typically need a PCI Express host bus adapter. But just like the onboard video, having 10 SATA ports on board frees up a PCI Express slot. What about networking? The Cloudstar board is above average here as well, with a pair of Intel i226 2.5 gigabit network ports on the rear. And as is becoming a theme on this board, having 2.5 gigabit networking built in means you don't need to install a PCIe card just to get faster than gig networking. Speaking of all those saved PCI Express slots, we've got a pair of Gen 3x4 M.2 NVMe slots for high-speed storage. We've also got two full PCI Express 3.0 x16 slots and a single PCI Express 3.0 x8, all of which support full bifurcation or PCI Express pass-through for virtual machines. But probably the best feature of this motherboard is the price. The Cloudstar board comes in at just $115, and if that was the price for just the motherboard, it would already be an instant buy recommendation from me. But the price comes pre-packaged with an Intel Xeon E5 2680v4, a 14-core, 28-thread Broadwell CPU, plenty of power for a NAS or mid-range VM server, or like I built here, a little bit of both. On the table next to me today is the legendary Fractal Design Node 804, and thanks to Fractal for sending this over for this build. While the 804 is starting to show its age as one of Fractal's oldest models, it is still an incredible platform for a desktop server build. We've got support for a micro ATX motherboard, standard ATX power supply, and a full eight 3.5 inch hard drives. And I've got 96 terabytes worth of drives in here. More on those in just a minute. Now, overall, I am very happy with the way this server turned out, especially for the price. In this build, we've got four 32 gigabyte DDR4 ECC DIMMs for a total of 128 gigabytes, a 14 core CPU, a 120 millimeter up here tower cooler, and a full set of fans, along with a brand new power supply from Fractal Design, the 850 watt Ion Gold. Not including storage, the base system comes in at just $595, and keep in mind that basically half of that is just for the case and the power supply. If you already have a case and power supply, you'd be into this build for less than 300 bucks. And again, as we've already talked about with this motherboard, we've already got onboard video, 10 SATA ports, dual NVMe, and dual 2.5 gigabit networking. 
With the three PCI Express slots we have available, you could easily add in, say, an Intel A310 card for video encoding in a media server, 10 or 25 gigabit networking, along with a quad NVMe adapter or two for some incredibly fast storage options. What about a couple of NVIDIA Tesla P4s for some self-hosted cloud gaming goodness? There is so much potential in this server in a very affordable package. But let's talk storage. For today's build, I opted to install Proxmox onto a pair of 1TB Team Group T-Create NVMe drives in a RAID 1. These will serve as both the boot drive along with storage for all of my virtual machines. For mass storage, I partnered up with serverpartdeals.com, who graciously shipped over a set of drives of my choosing. Seeing as we've got eight 3.5-inch drive slots, I opted to go with eight HGST HE12 12 terabyte SATA drives. 12 terabytes is kind of the sweet spot right now when it comes to price per gigabyte, coming in at just under $0.09 cents per gig, or around $105 per drive. Server Part Deals offers a wide variety of new, recertified, and refurbished hard drives, solid-state drives, and accessories. If you're looking for affordable storage, whether it be for your home lab or business servers, they've got thousands of drives in stock and ready to ship. Visit serverpartdeals.com slash craftcomputing or use coupon code craftcomputing to get $5 off your next order. And a huge thanks to Server Part Deals for sponsoring today's video. One thing when using newer enterprise hard drives like this with consumer power supplies is the potential for the drives to not properly spin up. Pin 3 on the SATA power cable is used to trigger a reboot and park the hard drives inside of a server. Unfortunately, consumer power supplies deliver 3.3 volts constantly to that pin, so the drives won't typically spin up. To fix this, we simply need to block pin 3. My preferred way to handle this is with a bit of Kapton tape applied to the hard drive. You can actually cover the first three pins without any issue, which is what I did to all eight disks here. Wiring up eight drives in the Node 804 is a bit messy, but definitely doable. I opted to go with some of the Silverstone Slimline SATA cables to help cut down on the bulk, and I think it turned out pretty well. Now, the Fractal Design Ion 850 watt power supply has SATA power cables with four leads per line making them a perfect match for the two rows of four drives here. One thing to keep in mind though is where the power supply installs, I don't know if there would be room to install a SAS adapter onto these drives. There's just not enough clearance there if you have one of the SAS to power connector uh, adapters in line there. But for SATA drives, this worked absolutely perfectly. With the drives plugged in, and for that matter, the rest of the system assembled, we can start digging into the hardware and plan on how we're actually going to run everything. Now, there are 10 SATA ports on this board, but ports 1 through 6 and 7 through 10 are handled by two separate controllers on that C612 chipset. I've been planning on running Proxmox for virtualization on this server, as well as a TrueNAS VM for file sharing. But to do that, we need the motherboard to support a couple of things first. First off, does the CloudStar even support Intel VTD and PCI Express pass-through? And second, are we going to be able to pass through the SATA controllers to the VM? The full story of this board keeps getting better and better, because it's a solid yes to both questions. In the BIOS, we've got Intel VTD, SRIOV, above 4 gig support, and even resizable bar, all enabled and working right out of the box. As for the SATA controllers, I was able to pass those through to a VM without any issues. Here I've got a TrueNAS VM spun up with 32 gigabytes of memory, and as you can see, all 8 disks are there and ready to be added to a new ZFS pool. And since all 10 ports are technically passed through, I could also add a pair of SATA SSDs to the system and get even faster storage or maybe a pair of cache disks installed into TrueNAS if I wanted. So there is a ton to like about this motherboard, and I think it makes sense for a lot of people, especially given its low price point. But there's also a few negatives to go over, starting with that 2011-3 socket. These V3 and V4 Xeon CPUs from 2017 were never the fastest CPUs, especially for single-threaded tasks, even when they were brand new. And even first-generation Ryzen CPUs put them on notice when it comes to multi-threaded performance. The 2680V4 is a great CPU for a mass storage NAS and has plenty of threads available for running virtual machines. But even with 28 threads, it's only on par with multi-threaded performance from a Ryzen 3700 or an Intel 9900K. Both of those only have 16 threads, and the 2680v4 is miles behind in terms of single-threaded speeds. This board is attractive because of its feature set and its expandability, not because of its platform. But its expandability isn't perfect either. One of the highlights of the CloudStar CS612 is those 10 SATA ports on board, allowing you to build a pretty substantial NAS server without the need for a PCI Express storage controller. 
But there's also a distinct lack of SAS, meaning that if you want to run 12 gigabit SAS drives, you're going to need a secondary controller anyway. The onboard networking is in a similar situation with dual 2.5 gigabit network ports. Sure, it's faster than gigabit, but 10 gigabit network switches are almost more affordable than 2.5 gigabit gear. It would have been great to see dual SFP plus ports on this board instead. Another missed opportunity is with the A-Speed AST2400, which as far as I can tell is only there to provide onboard video out. While that feature is very much appreciated, the AST2400 is often used as a lights out IPMI controller, and I was honestly hoping for similar functionality here. And last up, let's talk about those PCI Express slots on the board. The way I have the server set up right now, I'm taking advantage of nothing but the onboard ports and haven't had to install a single PCI Express card. That being said, I was considering adding an RTX 2080 Ti to test out a cloud gaming VM or two, but ran into a pretty unfortunate stumbling block. PCI Express cards that are longer than around 8 inches interfere with the SATA ports on board, which means that you're basically limited to half-length cards like all the ones that I showed off here. It even limits the potential for some quad NVMe cards that I have around the shop. The CloudStar CS612 is an amazing collection of features and is going to be the perfect server platform for a lot of different use cases. But there are some faster and more well-rounded platforms out there if your needs exceed what is on offer here. But you're also going to have to pay for those luxuries. Wrapping up this build then, I'm no stranger when it comes to weird Chinese market motherboards or used Xeons. But most of those builds have either been for gaming or workstation use. When it comes to servers, features like good onboard networking or storage controllers really haven't been a selling point of these inexpensive boards. For the $115 that I've paid, I got dual 2.5 gigabit networking, dual NVMe slots, 10 SATA ports for hard drives or SSDs, onboard video, and three PCI Express slots if you need even more expansion than what's already there. And it came with a pretty decent 14 core CPU for good measure. All in, with 128GB of DDR4-2400 memory, a pair of 1TB NVMe drives, 96TB worth of SATA hard drives, a cooler, fan, case, and power supply, and all of the cables and odds and ends that I needed here, we're looking at around $1,550 for the server as you see it on my desk. And keep in mind, well over half of that cost is just in the storage. That is a pretty incredible price for, let's face it, a wide open platform that you could do just about anything home lab or even small business server with. You can use this as a NAS, you can use it as a VM, you can use it as a little bit of both with a lot of expansion through PCI Express. Imagination is pretty much your only limiting factor on what you can do with this, unless that CPU starts to slow you down. I think in some future videos, I want to explore this server build a little bit more. I want to load in a couple of NVIDIA Tesla P4s and see what kind of cloud gaming performance I can get out of a budget system like this. I might even see about designing a fan shroud to run three GPUs in here at the same time. Let's finally cover adding an Intel encoding GPU for Plex for all of your media hosting needs. And with Chrome removing support for ad blockers, maybe it's time to revisit Pi-hole or other network-wide ad blocking solutions. But what other types of projects do you want to see? Servers like this really can be a jack of all trades when it comes to home labs, as there's plenty of storage to work as a NAS, plenty of CPU power for virtualization, and plenty of expansion options for add-in cards. Leave your suggestions down in the comments below. On your way down there, don't forget to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Blue Sky at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon. Link is also down in the video description and helps keep the lights on around here. And that's going to do for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. Ooh, that was a big gulp. Oh. Ah. Watch the review on that one. Beer for today is from De Halve Moon uh, Brewery out of Belgium. It is the Strafe Hendrik uh, Christmas Blend, Oak Aged Quadruple, clocking in at 11%. The De Halve Moon Brewery is located in the heart of Bruges and is widely known for its highly acclaimed Strafe Hendrik, Quad... Strafe Hendrik Quadruple. A very limited selection of the quadruple production is barrel-aged each year in the medieval cellars of the brewery. 
For this special Christmas blend, the barrel selection is determined by De Halve Moon's Brewmaster, combining Bordeaux, uh, Calvados, and Rum Barrel Aged Quadruple with Young Quadruple. This special blend is then re-fermented in the bottle, allowing for even more complex fine effervescence and an extended shelf life. There is so much malt mixed with so much oak. You'd be forgiven in thinking this was a whiskey barrel aged. That's not the fact here. Uh, this is brewed in uh, Bordeaux, Calvados, and rum barrels. But that oak is so intense, it reminds me more of like a really strong bourbon, like a, like a barrel proof bourbon. It is very, very sweet, but it's got this kick in the back of it. This is Christmas spice heavy. It is, it is all of that nutmeg and clove and, and allspice kind of wrapped up in a blanket before it hits you in the back of the head with some oak. Bludgeons you, if you will. I like it but 12 ounces is too much. This beer is a great one if you want to split it three or four ways, but at 11.2 ounces, I'm struggling towards the bottom here. It's just a little too much.